I'm Enrique Cerna. Next on Conversations, Ingrid Betancourt. The former Colombian presidential candidate was held hostage by guerrilla forces for six years in the Colombian jungle. She describes her ordeal in her book, Even Silence Has an End. We'll find out how she managed to survive it all. Ingrid Betancourt, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Ingrid Betancourt, welcome to Conversations. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You know, it's been, I guess, a little over two years now since you were rescued um, after your ordeal in the Colombian jungle for over six and a half years. I'm curious, what does freedom mean to you now? <laughs> I'm going to answer in a very weird way. <laughs> um, I think that freedom is... Uh, when you can uh, choose not to answer a journalist's question. <laughs> <laughs> I may be in trouble for the rest of this half hour now. <laughs> Are you still trying to figure that out, I guess? No, it's because y you see one of the things that uh, was hard for me when I came back from, from Freedom was uh, to see that, uh, my, of course, my life during abduction had been followed for, by many people, but then it was like if, if some journalists uh, thought they had the right to just get into my private life. And I, it, was, it was very weird for me to see that uh, I was, you know, reading the newspapers and found, finding things about my own life that I didn't know and uh, uh, this sensation of just being like on a stage 24 hours a day was something that I particularly wanted to avoid after having, you know, uh, with guards looking at me 24 hours a day during the abduction. So yeah. let's say that privacy is part of, of the sensation of freedom. So you went from this extreme, as you write in the book, of uh, the six years of being in captivity in the Colombian jungle to suddenly being on the stage as you are with me right now and elsewhere and your life as you said is become an open book and not all of it has been painted all that you know, nicely either. Exactly. I mean you see w w with freedom came beautiful things but came also uh, painful things and sometimes uh, I was exposed to, to, to have uh, people loving me and, and also people have being very critical. And, you know, in a way, I, I, I needed the, the space to just um, uh, being granted the right of not having to respond to everything because sometimes you're just confronted to people that ask you things and you, you just don't want to answer, you know, you just, or you don't have any answer. Well, fortunately, you're going to answer a few of my questions <laughs> here <laughs> because uh, you have had a tremendous life and that six and a half years obviously uh, um, was something that I think most people could never, ever survive. Before we get to that point to, you know, the abduction and, and how all of that happened, let's talk about you and growing up. I mean, you were born in Colombia to yes. a family that was pretty well known. Uh, very politically active. Uh, your mother and your father both involved in politics. Was that something that you figured down the road you would journey into as well? Yes, and, and very young. I mean, I remember, uh, I it must be five or six, and uh, I remember my parents gathering, you know, at night with friends talking about politics, and I, I was ordered to go to bed. But I would just, you know, sneak, uh, and and just I, I just wanted to listen to what they were saying. I was fascinated by politics, by by Colombia, by what they were talking about the country, and I had this sensation that there were so many problems uh, because at the time there there were problems, and um, I just dreamed that I was I was raised up in France, so for me Colombia was this 
illusion of a country that I loved, where I had most of my family, uh, where I had my cousins, where I would go for holidays to, to, to play. And knowing that there was this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, social um, injustice. My, my mother was very much involved in, in giving shelter to abandoned children that were very poor. And so I could see whenever I went to Colombia, I was very much t confronted with this reality of injustice. And I didn't like it. I thought I had to come back to Colombia and I wanted to confront corruption. For me, it was something that I thought I sh have to do. So eventually you do come back. You then become what is the equivalent of a member of Congress, uh, not only a as a representative, but then as a senator. And then you make this decision to run for the presidency. Let's go now to the day that you end up being abduct abducted, because you went into an area, and you'd actually had been open about going to talk to the FARC, which was the rebel forces. Yes. So take me to that day on uh, what, February 2002. Yeah, it was a Saturday morning. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to go to this place in Vicente El Hawan, who was uh, uh, the the place where the peace talks between the government and the FARC, the guerrilla who after abducted me, were taking place. And two days before, the peace process ended abruptly because uh, they kidnapped a congressman, a, f a person I, I knew in the Congress. And I thought that perhaps it wasn't the right time to go, but then I received a call from the mayor of San Vicente, who was a friend, he was part of our party, and he said, please, Ingrid, don't cancel your, your trip because here we are in the middle of this war. The FARC has, has gone. They have been evicted of the, zone, of the zone. But now we have the paramilitary chasing us. And we're concerned that the paramilitary, which were the right wing extremists, mm -hmm. uh, they were concerned that they could kill or, or, or take revenge uh, on the population. So at that time, I remember the government was very keen in just presenting the situation as uh, the, the zone had been cleaned from the FARC, it was under military control and it was safe. And the president of Colombia, that same day I was going to San Vicente to the plane to go to San Vicente to say this, to say to the people, look, I'm here in San Vicente, everything's fine, everything is under control. It's a demilitarized zone, you're safe here. Exactly. And nobody, I think, could just foresee that in this highly secured zone with military everywhere, with uh, helicopters going uh, to San Vicente and, and just, you know, patrolling the zone. Uh, the FARC would dare to do what they did, which was to uh, organize a roadblock. And uh, when I was in the road to go to San Vicente, uh, I was captured by the FARC. Now, I understand that um, when you were first stopped by the army members, one of the things you did was look at their shoes. Yes, yes, because I had been told, uh, you see in Colombia, you could find people uh, uniformed in camouflage Dressed uniforms in without not knowing if they were paramilitaries, if they were rebels, or if they were the army. And the way to make the difference was to look at their boots. If they had leather boots, that was the army. If they had rubber boots, those were guerrillas. So when I stumble on, on this group of men, armed uh, men, uh, well, I could see they had rubber boots, so they were the FARC. You were there with an assistant of yours named yes. uh, Clara? Clara. Rios? Yes. And as this ordeal began, I mean, did you, did you think, okay, this, um, well, it hopefully won't be very long. Or did you have any sense that uh, it was going to turn into six plus years? Oh, no, never. I never, never thought it was going to be that long. At the first moment of this abduction, I thought it, and at that time it seemed like endless. I thought, oh my God, I could be here like three weeks. And that was for me huge because I was in this presidential campaign. The elections were going to be three months later, and I wanted to be active and participate in the elections. So three weeks for me, like it was, I mean. What were they telling you about why they were holding you and um, you know, what they planned to do with you? They issued a press release uh, the day after my abduction uh, and the commanders were saying that uh, they gave the government a year to negotiate my freedom. They wanted to trade me 
um, to some guerrillas that were caught in the jail in Colombia. And they gave a deadline. They said if after a year uh, there's no negotiation and, and they're not really, none of our companions in the jails are released, then we will kill her. So I didn't want to wait until they would put their threat to execution. So I just tried to escape. And I tried to escape many, many times. How many times? Uh, I talk in the book about five of those escapes, but I tried m more times. The thing is that those five attempts of escapes were really escapes that, uh, I, I mean, I, I could go uh, away from the camp and get into the jungle and really escape them. I didn't succeed to get out of the jungle, but I really succeeded to, to just get out of their control. Uh, but there were others where I just tried to do it and I couldn't. In the first chapter of the book, actually, you talk about one of those escapes. Uh, Clara is with you, uh, although she might have been your assistant going into all of this. I guess the sense of captivity and the fact that you were in close quarters the whole time it had a real emotional and psychological effect on both of you to the point that where you couldn't stand each other. Maybe yes. she really couldn't stand you too much. Yes, I think it, it was, uh, well, it was very human. You see, I think that when you, um, I think that we don't realize the need we have of space. We need space just like part of our identity. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, when we're in a bus or in a train or, and that we have this seat that belongs to us because we paid for that and then somebody comes and sits too near to us we have the sensation of oh, we don't want to you know we, we want to protect our space well in the jungle it, it, it happened the same thing that we needed space we couldn't have it we were with a person that, that we didn't choose to live with uh, I, she was my colleague we, we used to work but we weren't I mean we didn't want to live with each other and, and having to live on top of each other 24 hours a day under a mosquito net in a space that was not bigger than the space between you and I. And where I. you have a hole to go to the bathroom. Exactly, a hole to go to the bathroom and, and, and the inconvenience of living with somebody that you have in your normal life. But you know, if uh, somebody snores and, and it awakes you, that makes you, you know, or coughs, or if somebody touches you when you're sleeping and then you're awake, or even in, in, in during the day. Uh, so of course it became a torture. A torture because we didn't want to be together and of course we didn't want to be abducted. But I think also because we shifted in the sense that um, we, the, the way we, we were confronting our situation uh, was different. I had, a, I had my children waiting for me. I wanted to get back. My obsession was to escape. And I think for her, uh, she had another option. She had no children and she wanted to just live as best as she could in that situation without being, uh, you know, worried with with escaping or w because of course it, it demanded a lot of uh, uh, strength and, and it was very um, uh, the adrenaline that comes with an attempt of escape is something that you, you it's not easy to, to, to control. So I think that for her, her options were different and it doesn't mean that one is better than the other, it just means that we were different human beings with different way of confronting the situation we were. Now, how many other people were being held at the same time that you knew of? Well, we were, in Colombia there are like 3,000 people abducted. Mm. By the uh, FARC? Mm, by the Not FARC, by the paramilitary, and by the drug uh, lords. And so also there's many by different delivery. factions here. Yes, so that's why there are so many people. And it's like an industry, you know, the industry of, of kidnapping. It's something that, but like we were, like people that had been kidnapped to betrayed as, as um, uh, exchange chip, mm -hmm. uh, bargain chip f for, for others, we were 60. Uh, I would say we were f almost 13 civilians and the rest were people like uh, soldiers or policemen that had been caught in fights. Now there had been some Americans that were also yes. held during this time and you know 
after you got out and you know you wrote the book, others talked about their own ordeals. Some of them were very critical of you, uh, saying that you made things tougher for them because you did not uh, try to adapt well or you challenged uh, some of the, the guards. And at other times, they felt that you know you had kind of tried to put yourself above them. How did you take that criticism? Well, with 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 you know humility, because of course. Uh, I was not perfect, and and you always have to try to be better. But I know that the, the situation where we were was difficult. But I also understand what happened. I mean, there were there were several uh, issues. One was the fact that every time they would speak about the situation of the hostages in Colombia, especially in the radio that we could hear, because we we could hear the radio, then my name was uh, in the news. And, and at first, well, you know, people would just, but because it became like the only name that always popped up, uh, I think it hurt them there in was a way. resentment maybe that built yes, up? Yes, yes. And I remember uh, one of them just always turning the radio off and saying, oh, we don't want to hear about you anymore. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than us because you're in the radio. And those things for me that were very hard and painful because I would think, I mean, I'm not doing anything. I don't want to be the celebrity of the hostages. I'm not doing anything for this. I just, I cannot do anything. I don't want it. I'm just thinking that perhaps if they talk about us, it's better that it, they don't. It could be my name or somebody else's. It happens, it's mine. But, and I felt like uh, kind of a victim in this whole thing, but then I think I was missing the point because the point was that we all were through an identity crisis mm -hmm. in the sense that being abducted, uh, you lose the compass of who you are because you can, you, you see, we are the choices we make. And when you lose the ability of making choices, then you, you, you are confronted with the question, well, then what's left of me, what, what, what I am. And I think that in this process, Hearing our names in the radio was crucial because it gave us the sensation of being alive, of being... And some hope that, hope. that people were still thinking about you yes. and haven't forgotten about you. Exactly. And yeah. I think because they were denied this, they were feeling that their whole suffering was like ignored. And now I can understand that they could be resentful for that. Were you tortured? I was. We all were. I understand that they actually tied you up to a tree yes. with a chain yeah, around your neck. Yes. And how for four years? Yes. You have the, the physical uh, degradation, you may be, maybe of them beating you and other things that might have happened. But it seems to me that uh, from what you say, that the psychological and emotional part of it being, you know, put in a cage and watched by a guard and all of these things was probably just as brutal as the physical part. Well, you see, the thing is that the physical part uh, threatens your soul. I remember, I remember once we were in this um, prison that they had made in the middle of the jungle, uh, a very small space, 10 of us packed. And um, fences, barbed wires, a very threatening environment. And this morning, uh, two guards came in the other side of the fence. And they, they began shouting. And of course, shouting in the middle of the night scares you because you don't know what they're going to do to you. You don't know if they're going to execute you. Or you, you really have this always the impression that death is so near and then these guys come and they shout and count 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 and we didn't understand what they were meaning count count what what do they want to count and then it was a roll call and they wanted us to to just i mean count us but so we were supposed to to give numbers so the first near to the fence would say one and then the second one two and so on and when it came to, to me to my turn i just say said my name Ingrid Betancourt, because I, I couldn't say a number. I mean, I couldn't say a number. It didn't, it was, I couldn't accept to, 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 
to be treated like a thing, like a number, like, you know? A number, nothing else, that you didn't have a name. And I had too many things going on in my head. I remember, for example, thinking that this camp was so much like a concentration camp. And I remember, uh, you know, when they would put numbers on the mm. people. I, I had all those things in my head. So for me, answering that was, I couldn't. And, um, and so there was this, you know, very bad reaction. The guards became very aggressive. And, uh, and I ex explained, look, if you want to know if I'm here, you just call my name and I will answer. And, and, and curiously, this thing triggered a confrontation with, with my fellow hostages because some of them thought I, ha I was being arrogant. They would confront me saying, who do you think you are? You think you're a princess? You have to give your name? You, you think you're better than us? And for me, it was not the... the point. I was not trying to be better than anybody. I was just trying to protect my soul, my, my, my dignity. And the problem of dignity is something that is always threatened when you are in abduction. Uh, I remember um, another time I was chained to a tree and, and the guards were, were especially mean. And it was a day that it was raining a lot. And I wanted to shelter under the tent with my companions, and because I was always apart, the commander didn't uh, accept my request. And then for hours I was there under the rain, and eventually I wanted to go pee. And I asked the guard, and he responded in a very violent way, saying, you do this in front of me here. And of course, I wouldn't do that. And those are the things that, I mean, that's a torture. That's a torture. It's something that, that humiliates you. That, and, and then you have to react with what you have in your guts, you know? And, and the only thing you have sometimes is silence, or is not to bend, or is not to accept. And because you are resilient, then you're treated worse than an enemy because they want to break your the core of yourself, uh -huh. that's the game of, of, of the thing. You were rescued um, two years ago, I guess about two and a half years, almost yeah. two and a half years now, yes. um, in the July of 2008? Yes. Yes. You quickly left the country, and you understand you've only been back a few times. Is the pain of all of this, I mean, in writing the book, in talking about it daily, is it a cathartic experience to get it out, or just is it still painful that well, I still have trouble to control my emotions. I mean, since the day I was liberated, I haven't been able to talk with my children or with my mom of what happened. Mm. And now I, I know I won't talk about it. So for me, writing the book was the only way that I could tell them what happened. I couldn't, you know, it was very difficult for me to just, we were, you know, after freedom, in this joy, just so happy to be together. And then there would be that silence, like wanting, they wanted me to have space to just, you know, free myself and, and share. And then when I would begin to tell something, I could see the horror in their eyes. Have they read the book? Yes, well, my, my mom read it, my daughter read it, and my son hasn't read it. So I think it's, you know, you, you have, have to... In, in the wake of all of this, um, you know, there was uh, a claim that you started to make against the Colombian government in order to get some uh, payment back, and much had been made of that. Uh, your marriage had evaporated, distance with your kids, although you're still trying to, to rebuild all of that. It seems like after all of that, you're still going through a bit of an ordeal and trying to find Ingrid Betancourt these days. <laughs> You know, I think there is, I, I, I think the jungle was a good training mm. in the sense that I was 24 hours a day exposed to all kind of bitterness and criticism from my guards. And, you know, it was clear for me that whatever they were saying about me wasn't me. 
And that was important for me, just to, you know, this strength you have inside, that, that it's like you armor yourself because you say, I'm not that. I'm not that. So when I, when I was released, there were two things. First, I was looked up like, like a saint. And when, when that was going on, I would tell myself, I'm not that. I'm just me. It's, you know, people cannot understand that I'm just me. And then it just turned out to, to because sometimes, and especially, you know, the press uh, oh, makes idols guys. and then, no, no, <laughs> then but they it, tear you down. No, but I think it's the way, the, the, the world we're in. Yeah, it they, is, they, it is. they build That's idols true. and then they want to break those idols. And I was a little bit in that position. I was, you know, in the stars and then into hell. And then they were criticizing me a lot, and I was just thinking, well, I'm not that. Ingrid Betancourt, the book is called Even Silence Has an End, My Six Years of Captivity in the Colombian Jungle. Glad you're free. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you so much. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.